Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. My name is Kirk Barrett, where I am here to do one thing, to bring you the best advice from the best leaders in dentistry. And after crossing the 500 episode mark, I just want to go back and say thank you. So we handpicked some of our favorite. And when I got this thing started, I reached out to a good friend of mine, Dr. Howard Fran. And I said, Howard, I'm doing a podcast. He's like, I got you, buddy. Let's do it. So you're going to hear. Howard came on. He went crazy and offered his advice for a successful career in dentistry. So stay with us while we go back and look at the best of the best of the Best Practices Show podcast. Listen up. I know you guys will enjoy this one, and we'll see you soon. Hey, this is Kirk Barrett, and you're watching The Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country, and we're coming to you live on Facebook, and I have got the granddaddy of all guests today, so you are not going to want to miss this. I've got Dr. Howard Ferran, so do me a favor, grab a pen, hit the share button, and sit back, because you're going to love this. We'll see you in just a second. Hey guys, welcome back. Welcome to the Best Practices Show. Again, my name is Kirk Barrett and I have you know who on today. And Howard, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate you, brother. Uh, it's an honor to be on here. I've been a big fan of yours for decades. Well, I'm so grateful for you because here's the thing, you know, you've always done this for me, for everybody else. I sent you a little email, you ping me back right away and you're like, absolutely, I'll help you out. And so I'm just so grateful and I love having you on here for a lot of different reasons. People listen to you every day. I listen to you every day. You are the master at getting great people connected in this great community around dentistry and putting out great information all the time, every single day. I am one of those bingers. I'm binging every day and I'm listening to your stuff. You've done over 633 podcasts talking to the best professionals all over the world. And you and I were chatting about this before we got started. I would just love to get in your brain as well as I'm sure the people watching this, you know, what makes a successful dentist. Now, a couple things just real quickly before we get started. If you're watching this, again, we're shooting this live, so there's going to be a feed below, either on your phone or on your laptop. Please ask questions. As they come up, I'm going to see them, and I'll go ahead and ask Howard the questions straight from you, and we'll learn from the master himself. So, Howard, how's it going, man? Tell me what's going on with you. It's going good. Just loving life. Life's good. Got four boys. Got my second grandbaby due in a month, so I'm excited about that. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. So like I said, you know, you started downtown, like I, you graduated from UMKC in 1987 and then you went on and got your MBA in 1999. And then you went out to Arizona, you got all set up. And as you were starting your practice, tell us what happened. Just give us, a, for those people that might have not, been, you know, like you always say, living under a rock, who is Howard Ferran? What did you do and what happened? How'd you get dental town started? Take us through that whole thing. Well, the journey was real simple. You know, um, my mom and dad were Catholic. They had seven kids uh, in about a week, and uh, we were very, very poor. I think my dad made $11,000 a year delivering bread the first 10 years of my life. And then he got a franchise. He bought, you know, Sonic Drive-In? Sonic, he, yeah. He bought a Sonic Drive-In franchise, and with one, the first year, he made sixty grand. And if you've ever been a little kid that's gone from a dad making eleven to a dad making sixty, I was just, like, stunned that, oh, my God, a— a job could change your whole world. And yeah. then he opened up another one every year for nine years. So by the time he got to five, we moved out to the richest part of uh, Wichita 
And my next door neighbor was Kenny Anderson, the dentist. And I would go to work with my dad and we'd make hamburgers and onion rings and French fries. And I'd go to work with Kenny and he'd make root canals and crowns. And I just fell in love with dentistry in the sixth grade. I wrote my dental school a letter in the sixth grade uh, asking, uh, how do I get into dental school? And they told me to go to high school first. And, um, but when I got out of dental school, what I didn't realize is how much my dad's the franchise model had taught how much business it taught me. So when I opened up my dental office, it was really like opening up my dad's 10th Sonic drive-in and we just crushed it. I mean, we did a million dollars the first year back in 87 when I didn't even know how to do dentistry. And so I think the, um, the, my classmates that I think were suffering is their, their mom stayed home and made cookies or dad was an employee at a manufacturing shop and they, they just didn't learn business. But the kids whose dad owned a farm or a restaurant or they the mom and dad owned a business, those kids did so much better when they came out of school. And it's just so obvious that if you get an A in business and you're a horrible dentist, you'll yeah. be a millionaire. Yeah. And if you're the best dentist in Kansas City and you don't know anything about business, you're going to have a very miserable career. You have to learn business when you live in capitalism, especially something like the United States. Absolutely. So when you say that, when you have to learn business, like give us some, th that's what I really want to go down. So when you got started, what were some of the key things that you did just to get your practice going? Like, you know, the first, right out of the gate, what'd you do? Well, I, I would say the most important thing is, um, you know, the, the dentists in Wichita, they would, um, all the dentists on the West side would eat at the, uh, the bowling alley, pretty much mm -hmm. in, any day you went to Rose Bowl West. And, and ate at the uh, the counter. There was three or four or five dentists there. And all through high school and going to Creighton University undergrad, when I come home and visit them, they would all complain that the the city of Wichita had two hundred and eighty thousand people, and the population never changed year to year because every time a girl got pregnant, a guy left town. And and but UMKC and Creighton would throw thirty more dentists into their town every year. So uh -huh. those guys would come and they'd have sheets of paper showing their yearly income, and all of them would show that year after year after year, they made less money than the year before. And yeah. they would always scream and, and yell that, you know, Kansas City was graduating too many dental students and so was Creighton. So I learned massive about demographics. And that's what they teach you in a franchise. Like, like you might go to McDonald's and say, wow, you have 38,000 stores. They don't, even, they don't even see it that way. They say, no, we yeah. have a McDonald's for every 25,000 people. And if that town goes from 25,000 to 50,000, we'll put one on the other end of town. Yeah. And so I, so the, the takeaway, um, the, the first thing you have to learn is demographics. So I wrote, um, I wrote the, uh, Washington DC, the department of labor, uh, no, uh, department of economic security back in 19, um, before I graduated in 86, I graduated in 87 and 86. I wrote them. I said, where's the future growth of America? And they sent me this report that said in the next 15 years, the United States would create 30 million new jobs and half of them would be in Tampa, Boston, Phoenix, Silicon Valley, and Orange County. And they okay. were right. So I looked at those deals. I didn't want to live in Florida with the insects. I didn't want to live up in the freezing Boston. And being from Kansas, I was deathly afraid of raising a family in California. I thought they were all crazy and on drugs. And you know, mm -hmm. But I looked at that Arizona, and all the people that were moving there were from the Midwest, which I thought were my kind of people that I understood. Mm -hmm. And so then I wrote the um, Department of Economic Security in Arizona, and said, do you have any economic projections? So they sent me all this data. And this is back before computers, laptops. So I got a six foot by four foot, big, huge board. I traced out the 303 census tracks for um, uh, Phoenix Valley. I put a black pin where every dentist was. I got a little white index card and wrote the number of dentists per people in each one. And then I arranged them from where I went, which was a dentist for every 6,000 people, all the way down to where there was a dentist for every 400 people. So demographic. <clears throat> demographics is the most important thing I'd say in the last 10 years, every time I see a kid come out of school mm -hmm. and they do a million dollars the first year and put 350,000 take home, they always went to a town of 5,000 and they're the only dentist. Yeah. Um, a lot of them went to a town of 2,500, but you see in Arizona where we have two schools, every kid thinks that if they go to North Scottsdale, where all the rich people live, that's where they would make the most money. And in, 19, and in 2008, when we had the economic collapse, um, I think Arizona had like 74, 76 dental offices go under. Half of them were in North Scottsdale. And when I opened up in Phoenix, Arizona, 
the town south of me, Maricopa, which is just a 30 minute drive. Did not have a dentist for the first seven years I opened. And then there was a town next to it called Florence, which didn't get one for seven years. I'd have all these patients as, you know, you know, I drove, it took me an hour to get here. It took me 30 minutes. To, and, and so these kids, they, they don't understand demographics. And you go to any major city, there's all these medical dental buildings and they seduce these young, dumb, green kids who don't know anybody. They say, well, we'll, we'll do your build out for free and yeah. we'll give you six months free rent. Well, why do you think they're doing that? Mm-hmm. Because they have a horrible, horrible, horrible location that only you would rent. Nobody, no Starbucks would go there. Uh, you know, if a, if a Starbucks or a, 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 a many, a many petty, you know, if something retail, would not go in your location, then why the hell are you going there? I mean, right. you don't do mani petties and hair, but you clean teeth, you whiten teeth, you you know, you, it's basically the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it really is. As far as the business, it's hair, nails, teeth, gums. They, they don't go to the dental office because they're worried about P. gingivalis and anaerobic bacteria. They go because they want whiter, brighter, sexier teeth, and they want their nails done and their hair done. And you're in the third floor of a medical dental building in an area that has a dentist for every 500 people. And then you think you're going to solve this n- massive nightmare demographic problem with a Facebook ad. Are you out of your mind? Yeah. So, well, w- once you got all that information, so then what you do, so did you pinpoint a corner? Now you were, you're not in Phoenix proper. You you're actually further out. So you could see the projected growth. You can no, put all I, these. I'm, up- I'm in Phoenix. Um, oh, it, you it's, are. Ca- yeah. It's called all the locals here call it Awatuki because it's the sliver part of Phoenix on the other side of the South Mountain. But it's okay. actually Phoenix, Arizona. But all the locals call it Awatuki. Uh, but but it was it, you know Phoenix was a fast growing town and it was at the most southern edge. In fact, right. when I opened up my practice, the town ended in one mile. And now the town goes further south about five miles. Wow. So so when I got here, there was about twenty five thousand people here. Now there's about eighty thousand. So uh, you know, so so the the thing I would say the most is demographics, demographics, business in three words is supply and demand. Why are you going to create a supply of something where there's no demand? Right. And so so you know, go in there. That yeah. would be that'd be my first rock solid advice. Absolutely. So once you figure that out and get the de- demographics, you've chosen a location, what would be your second piece of advice? Now, did, my, you, my, did you own or did you rent? Walk us my, through my, that. My second piece of advice is that, um, you know, I graduated, th- this is May 11th is my 30 year anniversary from UMKC Dental School. And I graduated May 11. I got my practice open September 21st. That's May, June, July, August, September. So it took me four months and 10 days to open up. I see these kids now and they're like, well, I need more training. So they go do a residency and then they go to the Navy. Then they go work for, you know, some corporate dental chain. And the bottom line is they're just fear driven. They're just fear. And you know, there's no good time to have a child and there's no good time to start a business. I mean, I, I had four boys in 60 months. It was flipping hell. I mean, I didn't sleep the whole night through for a decade because one or two got up in the middle of it. I'm, I remember one time I had a root canal at 7 a.m. And mm-hmm. Eric wakes me up at 3 and wants Cheerios. And I'm out there in the kitchen and he's eating a bowl of Cheerios, one Cheerio at a time. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is a nightmare. So, so you know, you, there's no good time to have it. If you thought about having a child and everything that could go wrong and the cost and the expense, you, you, would, you would do a root canal on yourself right now. So right. that would never happen. Uh, but you just have it. And opening up your business is, I mean, anybody who is adverse to risk, I mean, it's not a rational decision to open up your business. So the best time to do it is when you're young and dumb and don't know any better. If you just got married, I'd say, knock however many kids it's you want to have. I mean, knock it's them not out. a rational kids, decision if you're lucky, to you'll open up your business. business. You'll just so the best time to do it is when you're young. Out. And open up your business because you're not going to go bankrupt. When we look at bankruptcies in dentistry, um, that the reason the banks are loaning to these kids, I mean, they don't even, they're loaning, I mean, like 99.5% of the loans get approved because yeah. dentistry is so non-competitive. The only reason you fail on a bank loan is a personal failure of getting your license taken away, and it's usually drugs. Mm-hmm. So if you could look in the mirror and say, I can stay clean, I'm not going to lose my license from, you know, whatever drug you're on. I mean, you're only going to, you're only going to fail if you get addicted to something. So if that's not your problem, 
borrow the money, get in. And I also like, you know, the markets have changed over the years, but I kind of like acquisition better than De De Novo. De Novo is when you open up a store from the scratch. Um, I kind of like acquisition better because look, look what happened. Let's say you go to a town and there's, uh, let's say there's uh, 5,000 people and there's five dentists there. If you open up a dental office, now there's six dentists there. Mm-hmm. If you go in and buy an old man out, now there's still five. So when you purchase, you eliminate a supplier and you're not adding supply to the demand, the, the, the pretty uh, standard uh uh, demand equation. So I like acquisition better. Um, uh, but I do know this. I, I do know this. Uh, th- again, I'm going to go back to demographics. So half of America lives in 147 towns. The other half lives in 19,008 towns. And many of these states, like they take Iowa, for instance, you go to Iowa, they'll give you a list of 20 towns. If you go there, the state of Iowa will give you a hundred grand and Delta Dental of Iowa will give you another hundred grand. So you're complaining about your $300,000 of student loans, and you can pay off two-thirds of it. So then you go to this town. Then you go down to the city count, the mayor, and it's a town of 5,000. They got like eight empty buildings on First Street in Maine, and they'll say, do you want one of these buildings? He'll give you the building. Mm-hmm. So now you own the land and the building. You got 100000 from Delta, 100000 from Iowa. In those small towns, they think a really great job is 10 bucks an hour. Right. I mean, they kill for a ten dollar an hour. So yeah. So now your number one cost of labor, which is twenty eight percent, is now your lowest cost. You have no competitors. You don't have to do all these PPOs, and I mean, it's just it's just crazy good. Number two is when you go in to buy a dental office. I would say this: um, when you go in to buy a dental office, there's um, you know people are always looking at the numbers. Like dentists will come to me and they'll say, "Okay, I want to go to Parsons, Kansas, and there's two offices for sale," and they give me all this quantitative data. It's like, buddy, if, if all you've got is quantitative data, you don't even know what you're in. And what you're in is dentistry, which sells the invisible. The consumer knows what a Starbucks coffee is. A consumer knows what an iPhone is. They know the difference between Mountain Dew and Dr. Pepper. But look at America. 95% of the appointments are made by women. Mm-hmm. And no women trust men. Not, and, and it's not even a joke. It's true. Like, like, like go to... Take a woman who's going to make 95% of your appointment. She gets a coupon in the mail that she can go to your place and get a Kirk's oil change for $20. Mm -hmm. Then Kirk comes out and he's all smiling. He says, well, yeah, we did that for $20, but you need to give me more money to get your, an air filter. And we need to do your transmission fluid and your power. And what does mom think a hundred percent of the time? Do I really need that? Or is Kirk trying to upsell me? Right, right. And And then her air conditioner goes out. So she calls the AC man. The AC man goes, you know what? You know, usually sometimes you can come out here and give it a shot of Freon, but you know, you got an old unit and you need a brand new $5,000 air conditioner. What does mom think every single time? Yeah. She's getting the short end of the deal here. That's why women, that's why women, um, they're when you're selling the invisible to women, it's all about trust. Yeah. So you got two practices for sale and old man McGregor, he's been sitting there, you know, he's 60 years old and all of his girls have been with him 10, 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. And then you got old man Smith over here. His oldest employee has been there two years. He's got 5,000 charts and only has one hygienist three days a week. He was a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And he doesn't have a good brand in this town. And then there's old man McGregor. Everybody says, yeah, I love it. So, so when a, when a dentist walks in and tells mom, you need an MO, MOD, RCT, she didn't know what any of this means. And then you turn on your iPhone to record and you set it down there and you leave the room. She turns to the hygienist and the assistant and the first five to six questions are all trust based. Right. Do I really need this? Really? Right. I really have three cavities. Would you let Kirk work on you? You know, I, I got a five-year-old boy. Do, do you have any kids? Does, does he work? Four. Yeah. But does he work on your kids? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's all trust because we sell the invisible. Yeah. And that's and then these young dentists will go in there and they'll buy this practice and they'll see all these old ladies who are 60 years old that have been there for 30 years and they got a raise every time the earth went around the sun and he thinks his labor cost is too high. So he says, you know what? I'm going to fire these five 60-year-old women and replace them with five 20-year-olds for half the money. 
And then what does that town of 5,000 think? Oh, my God. When old man McGregor laughed, all them good ladies had been with, they, they, they didn't even stay for 30 days. Mm -hmm. That guy is a disaster. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to try to change your brand on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and all this bullshit with it. That's it's just noise. Yeah. They don't trust you. And it's the same thing with treatment plans. You know, when the, when the man is controlling and says, Hey, you can't diagnose x-rays. You know, the hygienist can't read the x-rays. The assistant can't read the x-ray. Oh, come on. Name me one dental assistant in jail today for reading a damn x-ray. Mm -hmm. there, there's think... not one. Not one. There, no hygienist ever lost her license from any x-ray. But the truth of the matter is this. If she point, if the hygienist and the assistant shows them the cavity, tells them that's a cavity, tells them needs a filling, root canal, whatever, they trust her because right. she's not the rich doctor living on the hill driving a Mercedes. And if you come in there and you don't let these other girls read x-rays, diagnose, treatment plan, and I'm not saying they have to, I mean, obviously, if they say pull number three, I'm a doctor, I'm just not going to go in there and pull number three. I mean, I'm not, you know, a, a, a lemming. I mean, obviously, I'm a doctor, but we're talking about patient relations. The dentist that unleashes their staff to communicate and, and diagnose and get out the intro camera and show the x-ray and all that stuff. They have um, far higher treatment plan acceptance. I mean, I can't tell you how many dental offices I've been in where, you know, the dentists, they always blame it on exogenous factors like the economy and Obama and Trump and the build a wall and the Chinese and you know, all this crap. And I'm like, okay, but I, I've heard all your noise, but you collect 750 mm -hmm. and take home 145 yeah. on, on the same number of patients, 1,800, as the guy next door, he's got 1,800 patients in the same damn town, and he's collecting a million four and taking home 400. Mm -hmm. And you both have the same president, the same country, all the exogenous variables. You know, that's why I don't like it when people um, talk about politics and religion and all this stuff like that, because it's noise, because you don't want to address the man in the mirror. You want to focus on fixing the country, because right. you don't want to focus on fixing your own damn problems, your own household, your own, you know, it, it, if everybody focused entirely on fixing the man in the mirror, we wouldn't even need a government. We yeah. wouldn't even have a government. The government is there as a backup because the monkeys are out of the zoo. The monkeys are crazy. Yeah. So you need this big, powerful government because you're batshit crazy. You mm -hmm. know, let's focus on your dental office. All those presidential debates that all these dentists watch. They could have been doing, I mean, I got 350 online CE courses on Dental Town for about 18 bucks, and you could have learned how to do everything in dentistry from business to root canals, fillings, crowns, but you're sitting there trying to fix the country, and you don't even know why your root canals fail. Right. You know, just focus on the man in the moon. And that's the other advice I give these kids. 30 years out of school, the reason I started doing that my show, the podcast, and on the online CE is that. I can assure you that 30 years ago, one of the leading variables of the tr super successful were the ones who took the most CE every year. Right. And they were, I mean, the ones who grew the fastest were taking a hundred hours a year and five years out of school, they had their fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry. 10 years out, they had their mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. And what I like about the AGD is if you, if your three dentist buddies just want to meet at the bar and drink beer and talk about Donald Trump and the skies falling and all that stuff. You know, you're a summary of your five best dentist friends right. in your dental office. And at home, you're a summary of your five best friends who are out of the dental office. And if, when you join the AGD uh, and you're going to those AGD meetings, those other five dentists who become your friends, they're CE junkies. They're on a quest to learn everything. No little detail is going to be missed. And so now you were five guys who are just gunners. I mean, they're just going for it. Then they want to learn implants and ortho and endo and perio and peer. They want to learn it all. So now your, your five best friends are getting their FAGD, their MAGD, their O, and then they're calling you up saying, Hey, are you going to that course on Saturday? And you're like, what course? Mm -hmm. I mean, it reminded me when I was in the dorm and you know, you tell a friend, are you ready for that test tomorrow? And they're like, what test tomorrow? I'm like, God, are you out of your mind? We have a test at eight o'clock tomorrow. So if you hang around with people who know there's a test tomorrow, who yeah. knows there's a CE course, who are telling you to go do this, um, you're just a much better dentist. So I would be, you know, it was like when my boys, I noticed a lot of my boys friends when they were growing up, they had a set curfew hour. Well, hell, I wouldn't know who the friend was. And if it was some friends, I'd say, well, he can come over here, but you're not leaving here with him. 
Right. And then other friends is like, oh my God, that guy is so awesome. You, you can go live with him. I don't yeah. care if you never come back. I mean, <laughs> it, it's not, it's not 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. It's who the hell are you with? You know, really, really, really audit your dentist friends. That's why I like dental town. I mean, yeah. who are these dentists that after five o'clock, half of them want to go home, watch ESPN, drink beer and say, they hope their dental office burns down and they collect the, the insurance policy. Yeah, And then the other half are on dental town arguing about the best bonding root canal, whatever till three o'clock in the morning. You mm -hmm. need to feed off that energy. Yeah, absolutely. What you're talking about, number one, you're talking about just self-awareness, just being aware that, Hey, look, I'm the problem. And you know, as a coach, when we go into an office, they're so quick to complain, you know, I don't have the right team. I'm not in the right place. And the team is really quick to say, look, uh, he's the problem. Like he's the whole problem. And the second thing is immediately out of the gate, what you're saying is so true. Find the right neighborhood of people to hang around with because that'll shave 10 years off your learning curve as you hit the ground running. And it's the same thing that applies for your team too. So, you know, obviously just being self-aware number two, you know, I don't even know where we're at. Number three, number four, finding the right neighborhood to hang around with the right friends. And then what about team? Talk to me about like, you've done an amazing job because you have people around you that have been with you for a very long time. What were some of the mistakes you made and what do you know now that you didn't know when you started building a team? You know, I would say, you know, I still have my first dental assistant, 30 years, Jan Sweeney. I mean, 30 years. I mean, um, I've, I've got so many people have been with me 10, 20 years. I mean, I think my new hygienist, has been with me nine years. Um, wow. the, the, the deal is with, with people is that you have to pay the most important to the team, uh, the people. And I, I look at sports, like you, you watch uh, the, the, the Super Bowl or basketball game. Yes. The coach is totally engaged, walking up and down the field, yelling in plays. You know, he's totally in with his teams. They come off the field and he gives a, they, you know, he hugs them and all this stuff. You go into dentistry, the dentist gets down with the root canal, walks in his office, shuts the door. Hmm. And I would like what I would like check out my patient and uh, talking to him and then greet the next one in the waiting room and super engage. You know, I, I want to I'm I'm in the game the whole time. I'm pacing the floor. I'm going out when they say, OK, I got to greet the next patient. I'll say to Jan, well, do you want me to go get him? Because I like to go out in the waiting room and shake their hand and talk to the next people and make them laugh or whatever. But you're yeah. totally engaged and, and, and you feed off that like like Dennis. How many dental offices? I, I can tell you just be by behaviors. Like half the dental offices in America, the dentist is the last person to get to work. Mm -hmm. He shows up ten minutes late. This patient's been in the room at eight o'clock, and he walks in at nine after and sits down at Starbucks coffee. And then when he's and he's done at four thirty, he's like, "Well, can you make the temporary?" And he goes home. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're the last there in the first leave, take take the opposite where the dentist is there first. And he stopped by Safeway and got a dozen donuts and, and he's in there first and, and he's the life of the party and greeting them and, and listening to them and, 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 uh, and also making them feel safe. Like you go to most staff meetings, the doctor does all the talking because the staff's not even engaged and they live in fear. Um, you know, a staff meeting, the dentist, in fact, if somebody wasn't going to go to the staff meeting, it should be the dentist mm -hmm. or the dentist should go and not talk because you need your team to talk. You need them right. to tell you. Communication, communication, communication. And if you put, if, if you had an A plus team and you did horrible dentistry, mm -hmm. you'll have a million dollar practice. Right. And if you're the best dentist in Kansas City and your team is miserable, you, you, you could go, you know, you, you'll just, you'll be miserable your whole life. It's all HR. It's 80% people. It's yeah. people management. It's quarterly reviews. And, and um, you go into dental town and people say all these things like, you know, I can't believe, you know, my hygienist, you know, you know, they're, they're always griping about their hygienist or their staff or whatever. And the problem with gossip and griping is it's misdirected. Like if your sister comes up to you and starts, I got five sisters and starts really, really unloading about your other sister, you have to stop and say, look, if you do this, you're going to vent and you're going to feel better. But you didn't solve the problem. This is misdirected communication. I don't know about this. I don't even care. But the bottom line is you need to be talking to the other person. And, and monkeys are a social animal. Mm -hmm. um, they're a very complex, wild animal. Homo sapien is a very wild animal. It's capable of intense violence. If they're in the right condition, they're charming. 
And under the wrong conditions, like the airplane goes down in a snowy mountain, they turn into cannibals and start eating each other. <laughs> uh, so the bottom line is yeah. you've got to create environment. And I, I think the worst thing in HR is not realizing that you have a toxic person in there that comes to work, the glass is half empty, it's not the man in the mirror, it's everyone else's fault, they just have this super bad attitude. And I tell my team, look, there's 168 hours in a week. Mm-hmm. I own your ass for 40 Mm-hmm. So in those 40, I don't want to hear about husbands. I don't want to hear about any of that. For 40 hours a week, you're on Broadway, you're on stage, and you're performing. Now, mm-hmm. when the play's over and you get a standing ovation, I don't care if you go home, get drunk, don't clean your house. I don't care what you do the other 128 hours. But 40 hours a week, your ass is mine, and we're going to get along, and we're performing we're live we're gonna have fun and then when someone just doesn't get it a lot of people are afraid to fire them because a social animal doesn't like confrontation you don't want to be the mean guy you want to be the guy that gives you a donut not the guy that has to fire you but you're not firing them you're freeing them up you right. just going to a human and say look you're not happy here i'm happy jan's have we're all having fun and you're just miserable So I'm not going to be codependent and give you a paycheck and keep rewarding you to come here and be miserable. You need to go find yourself. You need to go look in the mirror. I remember one time I fired a dental assistant. I said, do me a favor. Don't do anything in retail with people. You hate people. You Uh don't like people. She still comes to me. Ten years later, she went to a nursery and, be, and I told her, I said, you know, the only thing that you ever talk about that makes you smile isn't your husband, isn't your kids, isn't your job. It's your garden. Mm-hmm. Why don't you go work in a garden? I mean, yeah. that's all you talk about. And when you talk about gardens, you just light up. So she went up the street to the biggest nursery in town, and she loves it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so why should she be miserable working in retail? Because that's the one thing I noticed with Sonic. When you come to a Sonic drive-in and you order a cheeseburger and a hot dog and onion rings, you're so damn happy. I couldn't beat the smile off your face with a two by four. Yeah. But when you come to a dental office, you're in pain and you're grumpy and you're hurt and you didn't sleep. And then I tell you, it's going to be a max out your credit card. And, and you have to be a very loving, nurturing person to not take I mean, look at a flight attendant. I mean, can you imagine those gate girls when they have to walk out there and say, uh, yes, flight 117 to Omaha to take you home tonight has been canceled. And you know, you know 120 monkeys are going to fly out of their chair and scream and yell and call her horrible names. And she has to be ready for that. And yeah. if she can't handle that, she shouldn't have that job. She should have a desk job in a cubicle in data entry. So it takes a special breed to go into dentistry and medicine and nursing and hygienist to be able to put your hand on your shoulder and say, Kurt, I know, I know you're in pain. I know you didn't sleep. I know this is going to be expensive, but you know what? You just want to save that tooth. If you pull that tooth, everyone's going to think you're from Milwaukee. I mean, Mm -hmm. you're just going to, you know, you're going to look and uh, so it just takes that special person. And back to HR, if that team member isn't like that, well, you got to stand up and lead. I mean, look what they do with players. I mean, not only is the coach walking up and down the, the basketball, the football field, and all that stuff, at the end of seasons, what percent of the teams trade players? All of them. All of them. They're like, you know what? You were good. You were a B, but mm-hmm. I'm looking for a B plus. I'm looking for an A minus. And right. then look at dentistry. Oh, yeah. Ethel's hated her job for a decade. Mm -hmm. And you go to the dental office and there's a glass wall and you have to knock on the glass wall and Mm -hmm. she slides it open and hands you a chart, doesn't even make eye contact, and she'll have her job in healthcare for a decade. Yeah. I mean, that's just crazy. It's out of your mind. Yeah. Well, and when you have Ethel too, and she hates her job, you start to hate your job. And now your expectations are going to come down to where she's at. And you say, well, I could never do that because she'll never do that. And then you just got to get good with the results and over and over, it kills your confidence. Now go back to that too, because a lot of young dentists, as they're building their practice, they have these horrific experiences when you hire somebody and then you work with this person for three months and you go, she's crazy. And you don't fire her. And Aging is actually pretty good because when you get older, you just have less tolerance for the way things used to be. I'm sure you've had these experiences where you fired somebody. You're like, I'm not doing that again. And you're more clear about who you add to the environment. So what would you say to a young dentist who's watching this right now? Who's like, I got two people sucking the life out of me because you know this, it ends up there's a third because they have to co-suck and then they've got to try suck. And then you got to have a quad suck because everybody's got to bring everybody into the lowest common denominator. What would you say to them? 
I I would I would say that um the one the one thing dentists have a problem with is they're a doctor of dental surgery, but they often think they're a doctor of everything. And so many times in a, in a, in a business, like, like the dad was really good at planting and harvesting corn or wheat or small grains, but it was mom at the kitchen table that was really good on a calculator and worked with the accountant and the IRS and paid the bills. If you're not, if it did, if I go into a dental office and the average team members, the morale is low and the, and the turnover is high, I'll say, who's been doing all the hiring? Right. And they say the dentist. I say, okay, well, you suck at it. You're not intuitive at it. You're not good. This is not your skill. It's just like it's just like the happiest day of my life was when my mom said I didn't have to take piano lessons anymore. I mean, the piano mm-hmm. teacher said I couldn't carry a tune in a lunch pail. Um, you know, I practiced. She always accused me of not practicing. I mean, I just wasn't good at it. I hated music. And the only D I ever got in my life was in Spanish. And San Martin told my mom that I was linguistically retarded. Because he could say the word to me 10 times and I'd repeat it back 10 different ways. He said his ear ain't connected to his brain. So if you're not good at music and foreign languages, don't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I did my HR, but in 1998, I turned it over to uh, Lori and uh, she's just better at it than me. Uh, another thing that we do with uh, HR is if, if I come in, you know, we do a series interview. So I, I interview you, but then we'll have you, uh, you know, we'll have you. Uh, sit at a table and bring in the, the key management people. You know, who's the head hygienist, the head assistant? See if there's chemistry there. You know, if it was all analytical, Match.com could pair up 50 million people tonight based on an algorithm and say, this is the person you're going to marry. This is the best one. But right. why do they say opposites attract? Because mm-hmm. it's not the pedigree. It's not the resume. It's do you have chemistry? Do you mm-hmm. guys like to play? And it's not right or wrong because how many players in the uh, NFL, like, like, I got a bunch of uh, players and coaches from the Arizona Cardinals for years because their training camps like one mile up the street, their headquarters on I'm on Elliott and 48th and they're on Warner and uh, just like two miles up. Those coaches say that we'll draft this guy, uh, but he, he doesn't like the quarterback and they actually, they actually hate each other. Wow. Uh, they, don't, they don't even talk to each other out the field. So then during the game, he's wide open but his best friend buddy's in triple coverage. And guess who that dumb quarterback will throw to? His buddy. His buddy. It's chemistry. And then they'll trade that guy. And, and then um, we saw that in Super Bowl where people are traded. They'll go to another team and they got and they put up three times as many points. Yeah. So just because you don't fit on our team, you know, some of these dental offices teams, they're all bowlers and light country music. Um, other teams are all line dance. You know, they, they all have their flavors. They all have their chemistry and you, you build up this corporate culture. And when the culture is bad, the, the snake, the fish rots from the head first mm-hmm. and the dentist is the head capital Latin head. And yeah. when that culture is dysfunctional, that's yours, buddy. You own that culture. It's very dysfunctional. And I see millennials making a lot of mistakes that us older guys um, did. What, what are we, Generation Nexers? Um, uh, I was born in 62, so I'm, I'm a baby boomer, right? Mm-hmm. I'm a baby boomer. These millennials, you know, after work, they'll go to the happy hour and they'll get drunk with their staff and they'll drink too much. And they'll get crazy and they'll do all these. How's the next morning, 8 o'clock, how are you the leader? Mm-hmm. Your when, when she yeah. said, "Well, dude, you did shot, you did Jello shots with me till midnight," and and now you're you're telling her that she's got to come show up at seven thirty and run bleachers for thirty minutes. I mean, you know, um, I don't think you can be a friend with someone that you can fire. Right. I mean, if I if I'm going to reserve the right to fire your ass and that turns your world upside down because you got car payments, house payments, mortgages, credit cards, how can I be your best friend when I will fire you? So there is a professional distance there. There are lines in the sand. Um, I don't like to go to lunch with one staff um, because I'm a man. They're a girl. I like to go to lunch with two or three or four. It's always game on. It's always professional. We're not going to go to a bar and get drunk. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to do all these things. I see millennials making a lot of these mistakes. You know, you're the, you're the coach and you are and and I don't care who you think you are if I think I can trade you for someone else that can get 12 points a game and you're only getting 9 and you're not doing what I'm telling you to do but you think our wives are best friend and I'm your child's godmother and all this crap like that and then and then here I am firing you yeah so so you're not their friend you're their boss same thing with your kids yeah i'm not my four boys friend i'm their father 
There's a difference between a friend and a father. You can go smoke a bong with your friend, <laughs> but you're not going to smoke a bong hit with your father. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so I want the dentist there first, leave last. I want them to focus on HR. I want them to the in-between patients. Don't go back. You know, I'd like to go in most dental offices and take their private door down. Yeah. Because you always see staff standing outside the door waiting for, you know, the emperor with no clothes to walk out and, you know, take that door down, get engaged. If you nail the HR, I mean, I can go into, Kurt, I swear to God, I've been doing this 30 years. When I walk into an office, I can smell success in 30 seconds. Absolutely. It's just fun. It's energy. Everybody's smiling and you just feel it. Yeah. And then you go next door. And it's like a library, a dysfunctional mm -hmm. library. It's like dead silence. People are looking down. You come up, uh, may I help you? What do you mean, may I help you? You have no idea that I'm the dentist friend. I was coming to meet him for lunch. How, how did you not even know your dentist was going to lunch today? Do you right. live in a shoe under a rock? <laughs> how do you not know your, your boss is a dentist? I'm a dentist. We're going to lunch. How did you not know that? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. how did you miss out? People will come in. A man will come in and they'll say, um, can you sign in? Dude, there's only three patients next hour. <laughs> the other two are women. I mean, who do you think this is? Caitlin? How did you not know this is Kirk? How, yeah. how did how, I mean, there, there's, there's My just, name is right there on the schedule. You could just read it. Yeah. Know? And, and so, so, you know, you just got to get, because again, 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 I'm going to repeat this a million times. It's because you sell the invisible. It's like when I check into a hotel, why is there a paper slipper on the toilet? Because the maid never saw me see her clean it. Right. She's letting me know, Hey, you never saw me. I never saw you. This toilet has been clean. When yeah. you look at the, the cup, there's a little straw. You order something from room service. They leave an inch of the straw on the, on the straw right. and you never saw the rest. It's just their little way. It's the same thing when you order a steak and there's a little piece of parsley and orange shots. It's just a way of saying, you know, it's the little things that add up. And yeah. I put that little orange sliver and I left the little on the straw. Cause I want you to know that we're down here crushing it. We're taking it real serious. We didn't just slap some steak together. We didn't just throw this together. Yeah. I mean, we're dot and I's you're, So you're selling the invisible. Nobody knows. I mean, look when you tell someone they have a root canal. They go ask your friend Eddie. Eddie got a root canal on the front tooth. That's three hundred. Mm -hmm. A root canal on a back molar might be eight hundred. And then he goes to work and say, "Yeah, I got a root canal. How much was that? Three hundred. And he says, "Damn, mine was eight hundred. They they don't know that some teeth have four canals. Some have, they know when you tell someone they have three cavities, they don't know. It's all invisible. It's all trust. And I'll give you another hint: Facebook advertising. Mm -hmm. The number one Facebook advertising there is doesn't even cost you money. When when Shawanda checks in at your office and gets a cleaning and you just give her a free toothbrush, that, that's a waste. Mm -hmm. Only give her a free toothbrush if she checks in on Facebook. Because these average girls have two to 300 friends and half of them don't have a dentist. Right. So when she checks in on Facebook, when Shawanda checks in, mm -hmm. her friend Sharonda says, oh my God. I need a dentist and I didn't know mm -hmm. Shawanda goes to Howard Ferran and I don't know how to pick a dentist. So now she's texting Sharonda saying, why, why you go there? And she's like, girlfriend, I've been going here for 10 years. I love yeah. this guy. I love the office. It's awesome. It's awesome. So when that girl comes in with the referral, she buys $3 to one that comes in on a direct mail, a coupon, a radio ad, because you, Kirk sends me uh, this brochure, free cleaning exam and x-ray. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm, I, okay. I'll bite. So I come yeah. in, I get Kirk's free clean exam and x-ray. Then Kirk walks out and says, Oh, by the way, you have two cavities and they're two fifty each. And that'll be 500. And they're like, Oh yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Free clean exam and x-ray now I'll give you $500. And she walks. Right. But if her mom sent her to you, if her sister sent her to you and she paid for a clean exam and x-ray, when the woman already knows Take your car to this mechanic. That's my brother-in-law. He will not do you wrong. You right. take your car to your my brother-in-law. He ain't gonna lie to you. Yeah, call my dad's uncle for your AC repair because Uncle Gary, he'll do you right. I mean, if he can fix right. it with duct tape and WD-40, he will. Yeah. So when when women come in with trust, they buy three times as much. It's why when women get on Amazon. 
over 19% of their purchases are brands because they say, I trust that brand. That makeup is good. This lipstick, I th- they're very, very brand loyal. Because what brand loyal is, is when I walk into Costco or Kroger and there's a hundred different types of coffee, but I like this brand because I've tried it. It's consistent. I like it. I trust. Women are very, very brand loyal. They don't want to try a new coffee. How would you like to buy a big can of new coffee and it tastes like crap? Yeah. Uh, so they're very brand loyal. So when you're when you're going to be an associate for someone, you know they always come back to me. These young dentists will say, "Well, this guy's offer me thirty percent, but I pay my lab bill." half my lab bill. And this guy's paying me 25%, but he'll pay the lab bill. Which one should I do? And I'm like, dude, that you, you, you're not even smart enough to ask a good question. Right. I want to go work for the guy who's going to teach me how to coach a herd of sapien. Right. I want to go in and learn from the master to watch him keep you know, 10 ladies focused and motivated and energized. I want to go see, I want to go work for the guy who's had staff that have been there 10, 20, 30 years. Right. I don't want to go learn the best endo in the world from this endodontist who's an asshole who none of his staff's been there two years. He's got all kinds of turnover. He's, you know, so, so you pick the dentist who's on wife number four, no, no employees been there three years. And why? Because you got 5% more. I mean, right. more money. So, you know, same thing with corporate. You know, some of these corporate dental offices, they're, when, when I say corporate, I mean, most dentists are incorporated. So I don't like the term corporate dentistry. I call it big box retail dentistry. There's 35 chains that have more than 50 locations. And they're about 12% of the cap- of supply of dentists, but they're doing about 20% of the dentistry. So 12% of the dentists are doing 20% of the dentistry. Some of these chains their average dentist doesn't stay there for a year. Wow. And then, and then there's some in my backyard they, they just, I mean, I love, I love them because every time they go in there to different dentists, different hygienists, different staff. And every time they come in, <coughs> they want a second opinion on a $5,000 treatment plan. Mm-hmm. Remember they're 12% of the supply and they're doing 20% of the dentistry. Do you smell anything wrong with those numbers? Oh I yeah. Mean, you would think a sample size of 1% could have a weird variance, but a sample size of 12%, that's not a small sample. When you look at statistics, nobody is honored to have a 12% sample size. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That That's a huge sample. And they're doing 20% of the dentistry. That's a big testament to big time diagnosing and treatment plan, but they don't have the trust. Right. And then they come to you and they, they, they you look at these treatment plans, everything's, you know, everything's got to be replaced. All these old amalgams got to come out, all these guys. And then that's a chance for you to sit down and, and build some trust. So hire slow, fire quickly, get rid of toxic people, free up your staff. I go into a dental office and a hygienist will say something like, um, Dr. Kirk, you might want to, um, there's a little something going on on the upper right. You might want to look at that area. I'm like, a little something on the upper right. Did you not go to school for four years? What the hell is a little something on the upper right? Mm-hmm. Number three is blown out. Mm-hmm. I mean, in my office, that would, she would have taken a PA and a bite wing. She would have taken an intro camera and showed her. She'd say, here's your choices. We can pull it. If we pull it, we should bone graft it because, you know, you'd want to implant later. You should save the tooth. I mean, it's your tooth. Why don't you do a root canal bill and crown? It's this much. Then she can get on. Then she can ding up front to say, how much would it cost Simone to get a root canal bill and crown on three? And, and then when the time I walk in there, it's all diagnosed. It's treatment plan. It's so she's been in there for an hour. Now, mm-hmm. look at the revenue that doctor makes. Versus a doctor who doesn't let their staff talk, uh, the, the hygienist doesn't diagnose, she says, well, you know, that's not my job, or I'm, I, I legally can't diagnose and treatment plan, or, you know, it's like, come on, this isn't rocket science, there's a hole in a rock. Right. It's a hole in a rock. If you can't diagnose a hole in a rock, you're wasting resources by eating, drinking, and living on planet Earth. I mean, you know, this is not rocket science, this is a game of trust. Right, right. When you say the word trust, I mean, that's critically important. This is the opportunity as a young dentist. We don't have a shortage of trust. We have a vacuum of it in the world when we meet a new person. So this is an opportunity. You have a practice showing people you care or you don't care on the little things. It makes a world of a difference and a lifetime of uh, results when you're building a practice. So that's huge. 
and, and a lot of a lot of these dentists think that they're going to have a million dollar practice if they buy a million dollars of technology. If they have a CBCT and a CAD cam and a laser, everybody's going to be super impressed by that. I, I don't see any evidence that. In fact, Kurt, I see the opposite of that. Whenever I see a dentist collecting a million, taking home three fifty. They almost never do ortho, Invisalign, place implants, have a seat. They don't do any of that shit. They just yeah. got two or three full-time hygienists that have been there for a decade, a bunch of long-term staff doing a bunch of restorative dentistry. Their overhead's low, and they make mint. Right. And, and, and instead of putting all their money in CAD cams, CBCTs, and lasers, they're putting more money in labor. Right. Uh, because, you know, those girls that have been there 10, 15 years make more money. But I see so many people that get out of school with $350,000 in debt, and they think the secret is to buy a $150,000 CAD cam, a $100,000 CBCT, fly off Dominican Republic to learn how to place implants, and, and they, they just keep spending all this money. And, and I just, I mean, my gosh, I mean, almost, you, you've been consulting for years. Does, does the dentist who makes the most money, I mean, you've been, how many decades have you been consulting? Uh, two, oh, two, two and a half, almost two and a half decades. How many, how many million dollar practices where the dentist is rich doesn't place implants, ortho, CAD cam, doesn't do any of that stuff. Just knocks out a restorative practice. We call it the circle. They find out what they're really good at and they just focus on that. It creates a lot of joy. The byproduct is they're wildly successful. The other thing too, Howard, you've said this many times is that, we're not often the first coach. Any practice that's doing a million, they've already had two, three coaches in the practice. People that are suffering try to cross the six hundred thousand dollar mark. Seven hundred. They're just like, I can't afford that. I can't afford. I really need, you know, I, I need some type of technology. So they've made a personal investment in themselves, the practice, because you can't see all the stuff that's right in front of you. What's your experience? Well, my my experience is that um, if I if I go to a dental consultant and I say, what what do you think the average dentist collects? I would say, a uh, uh, million two. It's like, dude, the average dental office collects 675, but everybody who has a million dollar practice puts their money in consultants because mm -hmm. the consultant has seen hundreds of offices. Um, the return on invest, and I'm not saying this because you're a consultant, I'm not blowing smoke up your butt. Every, everybody right. knows that I'm the most politically incorrect. How my show's called Dentistry Uncensored. I'm right. not here to be your friend. Right. I don't want it. I don't want any friends. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I have four kids. I'm busy enough. I'm not trying to make a friend. But the guy who buys a $50,000 laser, and I see what that does to his practice, versus the guy that buys a $50,000 year-long consultant, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, there's no comparison. And if I look at the best practices I've ever seen, and I don't want to say any names because it'll embarrass Jerome Smith in Lafayette, Louisiana. I mean, mm -hmm. he's had every consultant every year for 30 years and right. his numbers are out of this world. And he's like, he's like, and he always says the same thing. He says, I've never had a consultant where whatever I charged him, I didn't collect that back and a dollar more. It's right. never happened. Right. And when these people come in this office, they see things differently. You see things through a filter. Like I know I have a special filter with Jan. I mean, she's like my sister. I mean, mm -hmm. I, have, I have my five sisters, um, Mary Kay, Jean Marie, Kayleen, Kelly, and Shelly, Jan's my favorite sister. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so obviously someone else sees, um, the, the things that I don't see, you know what I mean? Right. And, and, and uh, I, God, and, and a CAD cam, I mean, I mean, I mean, or a CBCT, I mean, I'm 54. Here's my iPhone. Um, could you imagine if I would have bought my, it kept my first, uh, it was a Motorola flip phone. What if I bought that for a hundred thousand and say, well, now you own it for life. Do you, you know, you every five years, you're going to want to throw your cell phone and your right. CBCT in the trash can, right? But you just bought one and the lease is seven years. Hell, you won't even like it in seven years. Right. Well, and, and, and then these oral surgeons and parried on us, um, you know, they're sending you cakes and flowers and cookies and all that stuff. Why don't you just call them up and say, dude, I don't want to buy a hundred thousand dollars CBCT. Can I send my patients to you for a CBCT and, and you can bill it, whatever. I mean, I mean, why would you buy a hundred thousand dollars CBCT when you could buy a $50,000 consultant for this for 2017 and then another one for 2018. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, same thing with implants. I'll watch a dentist come out $350,000 student loans, buy $100,000 CBCT, spend $50,000 on implant training, buy all this crap, and they've dug themselves a $200,000 debt, and now they're trying to get out of that by right. placing the implant for 1000 And then a businessman will say, you know what? 
I'm just going to go to the next town over. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm just going to go down to Tucson, find a periodontist or oral surgeon who's already placed 5,000 implants, and have him come into my office one half a day a month, and I'll let him place implants, and we'll split it 50-50. Mm-hmm. So you have no, so look what happened. You, you got no more debt and right. now you're coming in and you're getting 500 out of every thousand implant. The guy's already placed a thousand. So you're increasing your return on asset. You're mm-hmm. increasing your return on equity. You're not digging a deeper hole. These guys come out of school, $350,000 in debt. So they want to buy a laser, a CAD cam and a CBC. And now they're $650,000 in debt. And the only thing good about being $650,000 in debt is it warms you up for your first divorce which will cost at least a million dollars. So, you know, you should get to a half a million dollars in student loans to be, that way your your divorce sticker price will not shock the hell out of you. You'll say, oh, a million dollar divorce. Well, I, I, I paid off $500,000 in student loans so I can do this million dollar divorce. You know, keep it, keep it simple. If you work on your wife, you work on your staff, you're not going to have to pay alimony and right. your staff's going to sell the invisible and you're going to sell three times as much dentistry. If the patient trusts you, they're yeah. not going to trust a man right. and no one wants to talk about this. I, I, I want to talk about everything that's uncomfortable. Yeah. Women everywhere on earth. I mean, look at the United States. Never had a woman president at the fortune 500. There's only three women on, on the uh, CEOs of the S&P 500, the only reason I voted for Hillary Clinton is because I have one grandchild on the ground now, Taylor mm-hmm. Marie, and mm-hmm. I didn't want Taylor to think he had to have a wiener to be the president <laughs> or the president of the company or the S&P. You know what I mean? I, I don't right. like that for my own selfish reasons for my own granddaughter, but I'm telling you this. Women make 91 to 95% of all the appointments. Right. They're the ones that are controlling uh, the ATM, the de- the debt. They're they're more likely to be in charge of the finance by the man, ten to one. When you get a divorce, it's for three reasons: it's uh, sex, money, or substance abuse. And um, so the first two are sex and money, especially if you're paying money for sex. That's a double <laughs> double whammy. Double but whammy. the bottom line is the bottom line is mom is controlling that purse, mm-hmm. and she doesn't trust men. And I'm not having any problems, Kirk. And you just told me, Dr. Kirk, that I need three cavities at 250 each, 750. You're already fired. So you need to get out of this room so I can turn to the hygienist, the assistant, and start asking trust questions. And and so, so I just get that out of the way. I reverse it. I go in there. If my hygienist missed two cavities, I would just back up the chair. And I would call in the the other hygienist or one of the associate doctors. I say, "Hey, look at these X-rays. I came in here. Um, what, what what do you say? Obviously, we're not on the same page. And mm-hmm. I don't care if it's a hygienist, assistant, dentist. They'll look at the bite where you'll say, "Yeah, there's a distal on four. And I and I and I'd say, "That's what I thought. And then yeah. the other hygienist is looking at it. And she goes, "Really? But it's not quite like that. And then I'll say this. I'll say, "You know, when you think it's a watch, and mm-hmm. I think it's a do. I'll tell you what. Kirk, I wish you'd stay and let me do that filling day because what I want to do is I'm going to get back there and when I drop into the decay, I'm going to stop and let you, Miss Hygienist, come back in here and look at that. And then she'll come back and look at that and say, oh my God, I didn't think it was all the way through, but it was like oatmeal. And then I'll say, stand here and I'll, I'll switch to a slow speed, a number four round bar, taking out oatmeal. I mean, you can smell it and I'll tell the patient, can you smell that? That's anaerobic bacteria. I mean, so that, that, that trusting environment. Where if we disagree, we can talk about it in front of the patient. And and if you can just triple the trust, you'll triple your treatment plan presentation. And remember, if all your bills cost a dollar and you do a dollar's worth of dentistry a month, your overhead's 100%. Don't change any of your bills and do $2 and now your overhead's 50%. The number one cause of overhead is not is treatment plan acceptance. Right. I mean, if you double your treatment planning, and, and the national data is scary. For every 100 cavities diagnosed, we drill, fill, and bill 38. Wow. So we're only doing, and I believe this, I believe this. When you tell three people they have a cavity each, the de- dentistry is doing one. One of those people wouldn't do it if you gave them a golden egg because mm-hmm. Sapien is a crazy monkey, okay? Yeah. But the better treatment plan presenters with more trust in the office, long-term staff, they get the middle third. Yeah. And that's the difference between doing 750, taking home 140, and doing a million five and taking home 350 is getting that middle guy to do it. 
Right. You're not going to get, you're never going to, if someone told me I have a hundred percent treatment plan acceptance, I say, okay, your mom obviously dropped you on your head. You're not even smart enough to know that that's impossible. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sorry your mom dropped you, uh, <laughs> but you're not going to get one in three, but right. you can get two. Or three. Look, look at orthodontist. The ortho, the average orthodontist gets 30 opportunities a month. The average is starting 15 cases. So they're leaving 15 on the table. The ones that buy a consultant and get in there and really hone the treatment plan presentation, the finance, they get another seven. So instead of 15, uh, they're doing 22 out of 30, right. and the average orthodontist is doing 30. Now, both of those orthodontists have the same rent, mortgage, equipment, bill, out computer, insurance, paying market wages for staff, labor, supplies. You're not going to lower your overhead by paying uh, Simone thir- $20 an hour to fl- shop online for gauze and anesthetic. Mm-hmm. How you're going to make that money is going from 15 starts out of 30 opportunities to 22 starts out of 30. And of course, you're not going to ever get 30 people to schedule for ortho who came in and asked about their teeth. Because right. sapient is a crazy wild animal. But so so again, it's trust. It's treatment plan presentation. If you want to buy technology, get intro cameras, get digital radiography, get 60 inch monitor. So when I put that camera in the mouth, that cavity looks like you could go stick your foot in it. Right. And when she, and when mom's looking at that, and then start talking about um you know, hair, nails, and teeth, like you know what? I ser- and I, I'm serious, I've done this for you. I could smell that cavity. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You can smell it. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Do it right now. You know what I mean? So they, they, right. they care more about beauty than they do an anaerobic bacterial infection in, in, their, in their rock in their head. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. What you're seeing is huge. You know, if it starts with trust and then it ultimately builds the chemistry that you're talking about. Trust is a foundation for everything in any relationship with your patients, all that. So again, it's like the hugest opportunity and the chemistry when the chemistry starts to take over because you're Kansas City Royals fan. You watch what those guys did. You know, one of their major objectives when they took one of the worst baseball teams and made them one of the best, actually won the World Series, they had one goal in mind is we got to make the chemistry in this clubhouse. I want people wanting to come here, work hard for each other, and get rid of the clubhouse cancers, and then it just takes care of itself over time. So it's fun to watch the chemistry come alive in a dental practice. And I, can I can I say one more, one more? I don't know how long I get on your your show. It's an honor. We can go here. for three hours. We can go. We're going to go for forty want. days and forty nights. I, I just want to keep harping on the millennials. Okay, please. So here, I'm I'm one of the richest dentists I know. I don't know many dentists that um I mean uh, that have my money. My Lexus is a two thousand four. It's got a hundred and sixty thousand miles on it. Uh, I don't own a fancy watch. I mean, I don't own a cabin, a boat, a jet ski. I see these kids come out of school and they got three hundred thousand dollars in student loans, and they buy an eighty thousand dollar brand new BMW. You know, my editor of Dental Town Magazine, Tom Giacobbe, is celebrating his seventeen years with me to, uh, this day. When he when he started working for me, his car cost him a thousand dollars that he bought in college. He drove that thing. I mean, and he drove it till it literally fell apart. He had a house, a wife, and three kids, and he was still driving a thousand dollar car he bought in college. And you just walked out of school, and you just bought a seventy eight thousand dollar BMW. And 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 this, and I want to talk about the most uncontroversial, uh, the most controversial racist, sexist thing I could say publicly, and I'm going to say it on your show. Please. The bottom line is when you look at success. When they come out of dental school to predict success, the number one variable to predict the success of a dental student out of school is if they weren't born in the United States. They, mm-hmm. If they come here from Asia, Africa, Latin America, right. they are hungry. They come from poor. They live poor. They live within their – like take California. They got five dental schools. If this kid grad, if the kid came to dental school from Asia, walks out of UAP, they'll go buy a dental office. Mm-hmm. They'll live in the dental office for five years. They won't even get a house or a car. Their phone is their iPhone. Anybody who calls, I mean, you can call them at 930 on a Friday night and the, and the doctor answers the phone and says, come on down. You yeah. come to that Asian, African, South American dentist five years out of school. They paid off all their student loans and they got 300000 in the bank. But yeah. if that kid was born in America, 
it's entitled. It's entitled. So they'll buy a practice, and then they'll go buy a house, and they'll go buy a Beamer. And, of course, they couldn't share a car with their spouse, so the spouse will get another Beamer. And you look at these idiots, and it's like it's like they have more debt in consumption yeah. than they do in business. And it's like, dude, you're living like a rock star. Did you have an album come out that I that I missed? I mean, are you are you on America's Top Forty? I mean, how? Why are you living like the Rolling Stones when you're a 24 year old punk ass dentist out of school? And then I'll say to that punk, I'll say, okay, you're 24. Does your mom and dad have a seventy eight thousand dollar BMW? Oh, so your mom and dad have worked for 30 years and they don't have a BMW, but little precious does. <laughs> little little precious does. And then I'll say, look at this house you bought. Why is it bigger than your parents' house and your grandparents' house combined? How come your grandma's living in 1,700 square feet, your dad's living in 2,000 square feet, and dumbass is living in a 5,000 square foot home? I, I mean, I mean, it, they, they, they live out of their mind. Right. And I'll tell you what, minimalism is the best dress. I don't want to have a condo because I don't want to take care of it. Why would I buy a boat when I can go to the lake and rent a damn boat? Mm -hmm. I don't want an airplane. Isn't it easier just to fly Southwest Airlines? I mean, I mean, why do you want all this overhead, taxes, maintenance, stress, all this crap? Live minimally. What's yeah. wrong with getting out of dental school and moving back in with your mom and dad? Because why? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to get on Match.com and say that you live <laughs> with daddy because you, you're afraid it's going to hurt your dating chances. You know, the right girl would think it was just amazing that yeah. you graduated from dental school and you still want to live with your mom and dad. The right girl would think that was magic, but mm -hmm. you want to have the fancy car, fancy house. Uh, I mean, just, just crazy. So gosh, darn it. Live lower than the means of your mom and dad. Your mom and dad have worked. Your mom and dad are 50 mm -hmm. and they worked for 30 years. They're not driving brand new sports cars. They're not driving Beamers and Audis and they're not going out to eat. You know, the average millennial eats out 19 in 30 meals. Wow. 19 in 30 meals. Why, you know, why can't you cook at home? Why can't you live with your parents? Why can't you, you know, if you're going to invest money, the millionaires invest it in income producing assets, right? Poor people spend all their money on consumption. A fool and money will soon be parted. If you're going to part with your money, you better buy something. You know, if I'm going to spend a dollar, it better make me a nickel a year in perpetuity because I can buy a tax-free bond. I, I can just buy a government bond. Every time I buy a government bond for a dollar, it'll give me a nickel till the end of the government. I can mm -hmm. die and that bond will still be give me a nickel. You want to have a dollar? Then you need to buy $20 of these bonds. And, and, and if I can spend a dollar on something that will give me a nickel every year till the end of time, why yeah. are you buying a boat and a jet ski and a condo and a BMW? And I mean, it's just, it's just dumb. Quit mm -hmm. spending money. Your stress will plummet. Your income will go down. I, I mean, your, uh, your overhead will go down. Just quit spending money. And it's the same thing in the office. You know, when you buy something big, you feel good. You're like, well, I made a big decision. I just bought a hundred thousand um, dollar three D X ray machine, a hundred fifty thousand dollar Sarac machine, a ninety eight thousand dollar. I mean, you feel good when you buy something, right? And then you've got to pay it off for the next seven years. Just quit spending money, and 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 if you want to list, just get on Dental Town. Say, hey, any of you guys make. $350,000 a year and don't place implants, don't have a CAD cam, don't do ortho, don't do Invisalign, just do fillings, crowns, some endo, you know, I mean, just basic dentistry and those, and, and, and a thousand of them will come out of the woodwork and say, well, yeah, I mean, I've been crushing it like this forever. You don't have to do all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just keeping things now, crazy simple. Now, if buying a laser would motivate you you know laser either stands for losing all savings equals reality or light amplification stimulation emission and radiation you know when i put my four boys in the sandbox if there was a bunch of toys and trucks and pails and they play all day if i put them in the bathtub they get out in one minute but if i threw a bunch of boats and a bunch of stuff in the bathtub they'd stay in there until their hands got all crinkly if buying a laser or a cad cam or a cbct makes you run 20 red lights on the way to work it makes you be the first one there. It's a boys and their toys. If buying it lights your fire, then you can't afford not to buy it. 
Right. But if you think you're buying it for a return on asset, get a damn consultant. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's very true. Now, that's that's absolutely huge. We get to see that a lot. A lot of millennials come out and they just extra stress themselves out by adding all that debt. The other thing I've noticed with you too is people always say, where should I put my money? Put it in yourself, in your own personal development, in your health. Because a lot of these millennials, these younger dentists we're seeing, they're gonna lot, they're gonna be working a lot longer than you ever signed up for. Some of them are gonna be working well into their 70s and they got to take care of themselves. And you started taking care of yourself a couple of years ago because you realize when these are done, you're done. Well I, I would have said this. I mean I had I lectured in Los Angeles and a 92-year-old dentist came up to me, and he was an Auschwitz survivor from the Holocaust. Wow. Wow. And and the one thing all of us older dentists have noticed is that, like my next-door neighbor, Kenny Anderson, he just celebrated his 50th anniversary in his office. And you say to these guys, are you going to retire? They'll all tell you. We know every time a man retires, they go home and they, they just die. I mean, I mean, you, you know— if you're over 60 and your wife dies, half the men die within a year. In mm -hmm. fact, we just lost the uh, uh, member Pete Frechette, the uh, chairman, the CEO of Patterson Dental. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for uh, He was the guy who took it public. Mm -hmm. His wife of 55 years died five months ago, and he just died three days ago. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Nixon died, you know, just a few months after Pat did. I mean, men don't do good when their wife dies and they retire. And you need to get this retirement. Retire to what? There's 168 hours in a week. You can't golf all day long and do all these things. Like that. What the older men do is when they start getting about 65, they say, you know, every year I want to work one hour less and make one dollar more. And and I can't tell you how many dentists have come to my seminars in their 80s and their 90s. I was just lecturing back east, and there was a, like three or four 80 year old dentists in there. And, and they tell you, they say, well, I love my staff. I love my patients and I'm afraid to retire because mm -hmm. when a man goes home and just sits on a couch and watches TV all day, they ain't around much longer. And that 92 year old Jewish dentist from Poland who survived Auschwitz. I mean, I couldn't believe it. he was so excited because he, when he turned 90, he decided he was going to start placing implants. Wow. Now he bought a CBCT. He's buying all that stuff, but you could see the sparkle in his eyes. I mean, he looked like he was 12 years old and he was unwrapping a present for his birthday. I mean, he was just all fired up. That's when you get into implants. That's when you get into all this stuff when it's a boy and his toy. But mm -hmm. boys, the research is abundantly clear that if you're over 65 and your wife dies, you better start dating the next morning. Um, because if you're going to sit home and cry about your wife being gone, you're not going to eat dinner. You're going to be depressed. You're not going to eat. You're not going to sleep and you're, and you're dead. Right. I remember, I'll never forget way back in the day, one of my best friends, his, uh, his mom died and he said to me, Dan said to me, he says, you know, my dad likes you. He thinks you're funny. He's really depressed. Will you come over after work and we'll go over there and we'll cheer him up and we'll go. We winged in there. His wife had been dead a month. Mm. He was, the guy was sitting in a chair completely staring blank into space and had been peeing and pooping in that chair. I mean, I just looked at that guy like, oh my God, we had to pick him up, change him, take him a shower. They had to carry the chair outside and put a hose on it. The guy was mm. dead like 10 days later. So the mind is an incredible thing. Every oncologist in my practice says they guarantee you that if, if one cancer patient says, you know, I'm going to beat this. I swear to God, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to beat this. Versus another guy say, yeah, I was expecting this. I mean, I knew it. I mean, you know, I knew. I wasn't mm. feeling right. I knew. I, didn't, I haven't felt good in years. It, it, it totally affects the treatment plan. Right. If you go into chemo fired up, I am going to beat this. You got to keep working. And I just think it's a very sick, dysfunctional thing. And then dentists will say, well, I want to retire. I hate this job. Well, you need to fix that today. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to hate your job from age 45 to 65 and retire. What do you hate about it? I, I had a dentist the other day say, you know, I would rather be beat with a stick than do a root canal. Right. Dude, they're called endodontist. Yeah. Don't do a root canal if you'd rather be beat with a stick. They'll say things like, I swear to God, if I could shoot my hygienist and not get caught and not go to jail, I'd, I'd cap her today. 
Well, God, yeah. there's 175,000 hygienists. You shouldn't be married to someone you hate. You shouldn't be working with someone you hate. There's nothing wrong with that person. You two just don't get along. You have different chemistry. If you want to retire, mm -hmm. it's a sign of depression. There's something wrong in your cage. One of the other monkeys isn't being nice to you. You're not getting along. You're doing a repetitive task. Day in and day out, you're doing the same fillings and cleanings and root canals over and over. So it's only the people that make it fun. Um, what is going wrong? And and I want to say this. Do you know the only other investment I recommend than a consultant? What? Is a therapist. If your mm -hmm. marriage is going south, if you got anger management issues, if you throw an instrument, if you throw an instrument – you need to tell a psychologist. Yeah. I, I, I threw a flip of an instrument and it's stuck in the, I, I know, I know dental assistants who says, well, about every year he, he throws an instrument at me. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was a fable. I, I thought that, I thought that was just a joke, but I actually saw a dentist throw an instrument when it really happens. People really do it. And, and when you do that, you don't need a CAD cam and a laser, and you don't need to go to the Pinky Institute or Coice or Spear. You need to go talk to a shrink, a therapist, psychologist, says, why do I throw instruments? Because something went wrong somewhere. Maybe right. it was your childhood. Maybe it was your older brother beat the hell out. Who knows? But focus on the man in the mirror. Yeah. Invest in the man in the mirror. It's like people ask me, you know, did you recommend going back to get your MBA? That was a blast. It was every Monday and Wednesday from six to 10 year round for two years with 200 uh, people mm -hmm. at the end of those two years. I almost cried driving home that mm -hmm. two nights a week. I didn't want to hang out with 200 guys who we had, um, you know, it'd be two classes of trimesters. So it was, um, three trimesters, two classes. Um, so, uh, two, four, six, uh, then it was 12 classes. So to sit there and say, uh, our instructors, uh, Dr. Kirk and, uh, and it's maybe it was managerial economics or maybe it was marketing or maybe they, but to be sitting there with 200 guys after work from six to eight talking about HR and then that class is over. Then the next guy comes in and talks about Mario. I had more fun in that. I mean, I was sad when it was over. Uh, whereas when dental school was over, I would have burned that place down if I wouldn't have got caught for arson and gone to jail for 30 years because they, they, they ran it like the Marine Corps where mm. they're just, just extra hard on you and be an asshole for no apparent reason. You know what I mean? Right. That was, that, right. that was 30 years ago. Now these deans like Jack Dillenberg and who's the guy uh, at university of Pacific, the 90 year old orthodontist who uh, mm. ran that thing. Um, uh, but the, the, the bottom line is, you know, these new deans are all about, you know, building camaraderie. I, I love the dean at uh, AT still here in Mesa. The night before school starts, he invites every one of those students out to his house and barbecues for him and provides a beer and gets hammered with them. And I mean, it's just one big kumbaya for four years. And they love him. <clears throat> and, you know, they, they just love him. In fact, he's been the longest serving dean of any new startup dental school that's ever had. I think he's... I think he's like 70 years old now, but I think he's been or more, but I think he's been the dean there for like 11 or 12 years. I mean, nobody's been the dean. Art Dagoni was the one at UAP. When okay. I started getting out of school in 87, a hundred percent of all the dentists hated their dental school, except for graduates from the UAP. That was 30 years ago where they had the, and it was only Art Dugoni who thought I'm a humanist and mm -hmm. he knew every student's name. He shook all their hands. He'd go to lunch. His his door was open policy. If you're having whatever problem, they loved him. And that's what you need to be. You need to be, and, and I don't like any of these leadership books. You know, you always read these books on leadership and all that. Because, because you're, you're you. Um, right. And uh, you know, some leader, remember when that, that basketball coach from Indiana got fired because he threw a chair at one of Bobby his uh, players? Yeah. yeah. Well, some boys, they, that works perfect for them. And mm -hmm. they need a Marine Bobby Knight who throws a chair at you. Mm -hmm. Other people need a, 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 a mom or, you know, everybody's ever. So you're you. I don't, I don't know who you are. I don't know if you need Bobby Knight. Or I don't know if you need Dr. Phil. I don't, I don't know you. So I want you to go back when you were little. Who was the leader that inspired you? Yeah. What worked with you? Who made you play harder, dig deeper? Who made you be all? Because that says a lot about your chemistry and your leadership style. So go back in your mind. 
who was the effective leaders in your life and how did that how did that person touch you and maybe that's what works for you to touch uh, other people to be a leader to the ones around you yeah. but you got to get the leadership right and um, quit getting drunk with them and quit uh, doing jello shots quit holding their hair while they puke in the toilet and be their damn coach yeah you know well, and you said fish stinks from the head down. And a lot of this, when you're putting this all together, it fits perfectly into a great treatment plan for a dentist period because you talk about the physical. Now, tell me, I'm just going to, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. So I'm a young dentist. I'm watching this. I'm like, Howard, it's easy for you to say, but I don't have time to exercise. You know, I got all this going on, but when you exercise for an hour a day, get all that stress out, get your body, your head right, maybe listen to a podcast. Um, go into the office, you're a different person. You get a good night's sleep, maybe seven, eight hours of sleep. I watch some of these dentists too, and you see it, Howard. They're getting three, four hours of sleep. Then they say, I can't exercise. Then they go into the office eating a muffin, you know, and jamming down some cappuccinos to keep going. And they are half the person they could be. And it lends itself to a disaster for the rest of the day. Part of this is setting it up in a recurring system where you say, hey, look, I'm going to take care of myself so I can be better for everybody around me. What would you say to a dentist? who says, I don't have time for this. I don't have time well, to work well, you out. Know, take care. Yeah, what, what I did is, um, you know, for me, exercise is impossible because something would always happen during the day. So what right. I did is I uh, uh, signed up for Ironman. I've done three Ironman. I do an Ironman every year. And what I do is the time I'm not going to get interrupted is 5 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And again, every successful dentist has a, um, a consultant. Uh, the most successful dentists I know have had half a dozen consultants in the last 30 years. Uh, I have uh, two Ironman women, and they trade off, and every other day, they're knocking on my door. I mean, every wow. single day, one of them, two is knocking on my front door at 5 o'clock, and if they and if I don't answer, they have a key. They'll come in and turn on my light in my room, what up? And so you you just you just have to do it because um, – and also, I've watched a lot of – again, i watch a lot of dentists lose everything. I just watched another friend of mine lose everything, and that is they start with doing coffee all morning. And then they come home from that coffee stuff and do alcohol to wind down. So if you're doing stimulants in the morning, alcohol nights, it's this vicious circle and it just and it crashes. And I would say in my 30 years, every time a dentist crashes, it's probably 85% alcohol and 15% opioids. And opioids are on the rise. I mean, Prince just died from it. Um, opioids are, um, um, it's a big problem. And it's kind of weird everything changes. When we got out of school, the whole press was beating up on doctors because we were the bad guys because Mrs. Johnson is dying of cancer. She's going to die anyway, and she's in pain, and Kirk's a mean old man, and he's a conservative Christian. He won't give her the morphine she needs. To get. So everybody was telling us we were bad, judgmental people and to give more narcotics for pain. Right. So then we gave more. And back when I got to school, you know, so right now you have three 30,000. 30,000 die from Car accidents, 30,000 suicides, 30,000 accidents. By the way, the accidents are almost all male. The suicides are almost all male. Women attempt suicide twice as much as men, but women always, when they commit suicide, they'll like get a butter knife and they'll like cut their wrist live on Facebook and say, I'm killing myself. And everybody's like, oh my God, she's doing it. But when men attempt suicide, it's with a weapon and one attempt ends it. So the men are far more violent. They fall off trees, the 30,000 accidents. But now opioid addictions came from like nowhere to now 40,000. Mm. So the biggest, so the number one guy, and it's 41,000. A lot of people are saying it's, it's, it's headed to 50,000 within like three or four years. So, so there's, so we got to stop prescribing opioids because when they do the research with placebos, double blind effects, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen every six hours is still beating Vicodin, Percodan, Oxycodone. Um, in fact, when you prescribe Oxycodone, um, it's in there with 325 milligrams of acetaminophen or ibuprofen. That's the active ingredient. Mm. That's the active. So for pain, we got to get off these opioids because it, it is truly an epidemic. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? I forgot. Well, well, oh, you, take just, care of yourself. Yeah, take so, care of so, yourself. So every time I see a dentist going under, you know, I started with waking up to coffee instead of waking up to a treadmill, waking up with coffee, and then they're all wound up after work, so they wind down with alcohol. And if you're winding yourself up in the AM and winding yourself down, uh, there's about a 14 out of 100 dentists will go to inpatient treatment center in their dental career. Uh, it, it's a tragedy. I mean, I, I, uh, I know so many dentists who have succumbed to this. 
And, uh, you know, so just, um, you know, it, it's a disaster. You know what it's like uh, to go to rehab when you have this office and you're in a small town. And everybody's like, well, where did doctor disappear to for four months? Oh, well, he's at the Betty Ford Center. You think that doesn't get out? Of, get out? You Absolutely. really think in a trusting environment where they know you're hiding, you think this doesn't get out? It's a disaster. So look at the cost of not taking care of yourself. You need to wake up at the gym. And the thing I love about going to the gym mm. is we go to Lifetime. It's the same people every morning. It's like yeah. extended family. If mm. we go on a bike ride, a run, a jog, a swim, it's all the same people. And I would say three years of doing this every day. Um, some of my best damn friends are at the gym. So they pick yeah. you up. So they're, they're getting you on fire and they're, they're being fun. You don't go to the gym and you throw an instrument at work. What would happen if I went to the gym and I threw a barbell at some guy? You're gone. I, I'm the oldest, fattest guy in that gym. I I'd be dead. I mean, mm -hmm. so they're, they're, you're a summation of the people around you at home, at work, the gym fires you up. Then you, you carry that to the office and you fire up your staff. Your customers don't come first. Your patients come first. When, when people come in there and they scream and they yell and they cuss and they frazzle my staff, I fire them. I have fired them at the front desk in front of a waiter. And I remember one time I told the guy, you get your ass out. You will never talk to one of my girls that way. You get out of here. And if you ever walk back in here, I'm calling 911. And when wow. the guy left, the people in the waiting room started clapping. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, you know, so, you know, just, it, you got to take care of yourself. I mean, we're all going to die anyway. I mean, we're right. all, you know, but when right now our species is tracked back 2 million years to the first two, a mm -hmm. hundred billion sapiens have come and gone. Mm -hmm. There's seven and a half billion sapiens alive today. I care about the other seven and a half billion about as much as I care about the first 100 billion. I mean, my, it's not my fault to think about Russia and the Ukraine and North Korea and all that stuff. That's noise. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to think about the first hundred billion that lived and I'm not going to think about North Korea. I'm going to look at that man in the mirror. I'm going to take care of that man in the mirror. I'm going to focus half my time on my four boys and half my time on my business. And if you focus on the man in the mirror, you know, it's all going to take care of itself. Just focus, put all your effort in the man in the mirror. Quit thinking about North Korea. Absolutely. And if you're watching this too, you know, when you hit the slippery slope, I mean, if you're a doctor or dentist, you know, you get home and you open that first glass, you know, that bottle of wine, you have that first glass, that second glass, you know, you're starting to hit the beginning of the slippery slope. And I've had a lot of dentists say, hey, look, I, this is, I, I can see where this is headed. And a lot of them say, I'm not doing it anymore. And, and it's compensation for other methods. And I think you're right on target, you know, Howard, when you talk about fixing every, you've got to fix us, you've got to fix the practice. Because when you get a really good, first of all, take care of yourself physically, get the right people around you, you know, get the right mindset. It changes everything. You attract different kinds of patients. You attract different kinds of team members. And then you look around, you say, Hey, this is fun. This is fun. So see, I can, I can tell that you're working with high overhead dentists. Cause you said a bottle of wine, a real man would drink it out of a box. There you go. Box low yeah. overhead wine, not low that overhead. fancy the, bottled the wine. Yeah. Yeah. This, where you put yeah, 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 Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If well, it's got, not, if it's not in a box, you're spending too much money. Stop yeah. spending money. Amen. That's a big source of the stress. It is. It is. So taking care of yourself physically. Now you mentioned the mindset. Talk about the mindset. So I'm a, if I'm a young dentist watching this, where do I start to get my mind right? You know, I'm getting around the right people. I'm taking care of myself. Finding the right. Well, how do I take care of this up here? Well, all, all readers, all, all leaders are readers. I mean, I could pan over right now to my library. I mean, I've, I've read a thousand autobiographies. I love autobiographies. History. I mean, I read grinding out the uh, making of McDonald's, uh, Andy Grove of Intel, only the paranoid survive. I mean, I've killed a book a week. I mean, I'm 54. I kill a book a week. Um, when I watch TV, I don't want to watch um, reality TV crap. I'd rather watch a documentary. You want to go see a great movie on the big screen right now? Go see the founder. The really? making of McDonald's with uh, Michael Keaton. It's I read the book 20 years ago. I actually met Ray Kroc when I was 10 years old because my dad was always going to restaurant franchise. I mean, just just feed your mind with fuel. I don't like fiction. I like to I like information. History always repeats itself. I love history. I love um, um, I just love history. I love autobiography. I would say most of all my best friends and major influences in my life are all dead men who wrote a book 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, and some of these billionaires that you could never meet, like Andy Grove, the founder of Intel. I mean, he wrote only the paranoids could survive. And I just love those people. And that's why I wrote my book. I wrote my book, um, Uncomplicated Business, You Only Manage People, Time and Money, because I got so much out of all my books that I read. I thought, okay, Howard, look, you're 50. You do a million dollars a month. You got an MBA. You've been doing this for 30 years. You need to sit down and give back. I mean, what what does the book cost? I mean, like it's like eight bucks on uh, on Amazon. It's got a uh, fifty seven reviews. They're all five star reviews. But that was that was out of duty to the thousand books I read. I mean, I mean, look, look at um, the the richest man, the richest people out there, like Bill Gates. I mean, he he wrote a book, the the um, the road to success or whatever it was called. And I mean, these, these Michael Dell, all of these guys give back. The first. Um, the first ones that I gave back were the, uh, the founders of P and G, they were the first ones that ever wrote a book. The billionaires used to always be afraid of the people they mm-hmm. were afraid of. They didn't want to be seen. They thought they might get shot, you know, that they were doing something wrong. And it was about 1880 before one of them said, well, maybe, maybe there's just some kid out there that wants to know the difference, um, between, you know, how a business mind works. Then it really didn't take off until like the seventies or eighties, but read, read, read things. And that's why that's another reason I don't like, um, politics. And these people watch the news, these dentists, you know, they'll, they'll go home and they'll watch the presidential speech and they're yelling and they're screaming. And they're, and I had to train my four boys this, you know, because they'll come home and they'll talk about one deal and they're all lovey and talky and this and that. And then the subject will switch to religion or politics and their voice goes up and they're animated and they're breathing hard. And it's like, I'm not having fun. Mm-hmm. I'm not having fun. And if I spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the rest of my life, am I going to have any impact on Putin or North Korea or Trump or Obama? Am I going to have any impact? No. No. But if I came home and watched an online CE course on Endo, because I hate Endo, let's say, mm-hmm. and then some guy showed me a trick that's that makes me hate Endo, and I did that, and now the patient comes in and they're in pain, and like I can fix that, and mm-hmm. then you fix that, and then they give you $800. And and then I would say one last thing about a minimalism deal. You know, the dentists always say they're going to retire. And that's worse than not working out because on my evidence, every dentist who retires falls apart and dies rapidly. Mm -hmm. And the oldest dentist I know, and all the oldest as I see, my my roommate was George Rui. His dad was George Rui Sr., but his grandfather um, was George Rory the first, and he practiced till he was 92. He died at the chair. Wow. 92. And I had breakfast with him and, and he showered every day, put on a three piece suit, cooked himself eggs and bacon, butter, the whole nine yards. And he told me when I was at UMKC dental school, the first time they won the world series, mm-hmm. I went there 84 to 87. Um, he told me that the only reason he didn't retire because in his life, every man that retired, only lived two or three years after that and they were dead and he was a he didn't want to retire because he didn't want to die Mm. and now here i am 30 years later and i look at all these 80 year olds i mean the only living auschwitz survivor he told me he's the only one that he knows of that's still alive from auschwitz is a dentist in la who's 92 and he just learned implants i mean so you don't want to retire you and but the the other thing is, is um these dentists, they get out of school, they got $350,000 student loans, so they're going to work four days a week. Mm-hmm. So Friday, they rest up, they go golf, they nerd, nerd, nerd. Saturday, they kind of get bored. By Sunday, they go to Home Depot and start a $5,000 kitchen remodel job. Mm-hmm. When I got out of school, I noticed that the people who took off Friday, Saturday, and Sunday spent the most personal money, and the dentists who worked six days a week we're too tired to spend. When you work six days a week, when you go home, you want to you want to sit down and pass out. And on Sunday, you just want to sleep all day. You sure as hell don't want to go to Home Depot and start mm-hmm. a new lawn project and start putting up a new fence and all that stuff. So that's the other thing the millennials do. A three day weekend is a, is it turns you into a spending holic because you're a monkey and you're bored. Mm-hmm. So if you're bored, you have too much time on your hands. And if you have any debt at all, and I'm talking about one dollar then you should be working more hours in your dental office. Yeah. Every hour you work in your, like you take off Friday. So then you go pay $250 to go golf at Troon. Well, you could have stayed in your office and done one filling and made 250, but you went and spent 250. That's a $500 difference. 
Mm -hmm. And then Monday through Thursday, every dentist is open. But Friday, half the dentists are closed. Saturday, 80% of the dentists are closed. And on Sunday, they're all closed. And and I'll, and I'll leave on one more. Can I just make one more racist, uh, cultural, uh, ethnic uh, Absolutely. Uh, offense? Go for it. So much of what we do is cultural and racist. And let me give you an example of that. Like um, you come out of med school and you come here and I'll say, Kurt, I'm going to hire you. We have a hospital where I'm 24 hours, seven days a week. You're going to work Monday at 6 a.m., a 24-hour shift, and you're going to come and work Thursday at 6 a.m. for a 24-hour shift. So you're going to work two days, 24 hours each. You're going to work for me 48 hours a week. Kirk says, thank you for the job, and you come take it. Then you hire a dentist, different culture. Uh, Kurt, instead of leaving at 5, we're gonna we want you to stay till 7. 7? Are you out of your mind? I'm not staying till 7. I'm a doctor. I at five o'clock I go home. I mean, it's just a different culture. Look at the racial culture difference in fast food in Arizona. All the Italian pizzerias will deliver to my house. Every Chinese restaurant delivered to my house. In Phoenix, Arizona, not one Mexican in the state will deliver food to your house. Hmm. They'll come to your house and be a maid. They'll come to your house and they'll do yard work. They'll come and do construction. And, and, and it's like, so So then look at dentistry. So then let's say that I was going to own a Mexican restaurant. Let's say they took my license away because I was crazy. And I, I would open up a Mexican restaurant and I'd have deliver. Mm -hmm. I'd be the only Mexican restaurant owned by a white cracker who's Irish. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, well, white cracker Irishman, we deliver. Yeah, And it would just be my, I mean, when McDonald's opened up their franchise, there'd be a small town of 5,000. There'd be a couple of hamburger joints that have been there for 40 years. McDonald's would roll into town and they'd have a drive through and 60% of their customers went through the drive through And then I'd ask you, well, Kurt, you were born in this town of 5,000. You've lived here your whole life. How did you not know 60% of your customers didn't want to get out of the car and walk in? How did you miss that? Yeah. If I was going to be a dentist... I would be the Chinese dentist that delivered. I mean, if all the dentists are open Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5, those, those are the only hours you probably should even be open. You know, in Phoenix, Arizona, on if something happens to you on Sunday, you better break a leg because the hospitals will be open. Because mm -hmm. if you got a toothache, there's not a dentist in the state of Arizona who will see you on a Sunday. Look at, look at the emergency rooms. 8%. Of the emergencies are odontogenic in origin. Now, think about that. I can go into the hospital with a heart attack, and they can do a bypass. I can go in there with a, with a lime-sized tumor in my brain, and they can remove it. But I go in there with a toothache. They're like, wow. Well, I mean, what are we going to do? We can't deliver two tacos and a burrito to a house. How could we treat this? And you're sitting there thinking, dude, this is 8% of your customers. You can remove a brain tumor and do a bypass? And do a colonoscopy, but you don't see it. You can't fix a damn tooth. No, no, not around mm -hmm. here. So there's so much cultural bias of why doctors won't do a 24 hour shift. Dentists won't do a 24 hour shift, but physicians will. Why Chinese will deliver food to your house, but Mexicans won't. Why a hospital can do a bypass, but can't remove a damn tooth. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand the cultural inefficiencies, the cultural biases. Like my two oldest sisters went straight into the Catholic nunnery after high school. My sister woke me up this morning with some religious text because it's Ash Wednesday. Do you think I could give my sister a one-day seminar and turn her into a Jew, a Muslim, or a Hindu? No. No. Do you think I could get a dentist to open up on Sunday? No. Do you think I could get a Mexican restaurant to deliver two tacos to my house? Probably not. No. So if you've got... $350,000 of student loans, find out what these biases are, these cultural inefficiencies. Where does the marketplace fail due to your religious ethnic upbringing mm -hmm. and capitalize on it? Create a supply that people are demanding that no one else will supply because of their cultural biases. Right. That I work Monday through Thursday, eight to four. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this town this town loses 100% of all of its dentists on Sunday. This town loses 100% of all of its dentists after 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me Don't tell me that Arizona has 6,000 dentists because if it's 7 p.m., it doesn't have a dentist. Mm -hmm. Go into a hospital. If I was going to open up a dental office, it'd be in the emergency room of the biggest hospital <laughs> in Arizona. You know? You'd have a steady stream of patients, that's for sure. Oh, it'd be eight out of every hundred. Yeah. 
And talk about opioid addiction. You know what they do with every toothache? What? They give them them Pen VK and Vicodin. Mm, That's so true. And the Pen VK will do nothing 90% of the time. It's not a bacterial infection throughout the body. And the opioid, the only thing working in Vicodin is the acetaminophen. Yeah. Yeah. So that's powerful, buddy. Now, other things. What are some last, you know, a couple of last pieces of advice? If you're a young dentist watching this, here's some other things I would do, either in your schedule, how you set up your practice. What what else would you do? Um, well, I'm getting uh, I'm getting texted. I gotta go see a patient. So oh, I gotta, gotta I gotta I gotta right. I gotta roll, but um I gotta go actually do dentistry. But um I, I would just say supply and demand, you know, yeah. go rural. Um what dentists do is they wake up in the suburb where there's a dentist for every 2,000 and they commute an hour into work. And by the time they get downtown, there's a dentist for 500. But if they got up in the morning and commuted an hour out of town, they'd find a town of 1,200 people who didn't have a dentist. Yeah. And those are the ones making all the money. Um, I would keep your overhead down. I would, I would don't buy something. It'll make you feel good. It'll give you instant gratification to buy something big, and then you'll have buyer's regret forever. Um, get on, get on Dental Town. I mean, Absolutely. I mean, on your phone, there's a quarter million dentists on Dental Town. The app is free. Um, I have a search bar, and by the way, that little that little magnifying search bar, that's a fifty thousand dollar Google appliance that I buy, and you can't upgrade the software. You have to buy a new fifty thousand dollar box. And so you have a question like someone saying that you should use uh, Bruxer or are you worried about overhead? If you just went in there and typed in overhead, it'd mm-hmm. pull up. There's been a quarter million dentists have posted five million times. It'd pull up every thread on overhead. Yeah. And these are your homies. These are people talking about overhead. So if you're, if you don't know, um, uh, Bruxer, say you broke a file, just it's, it's 50 categories, root canals, fillings, crowns, implants, practice management, marketing. And I, I, I'll, I'll end on this. Can I, can I give my one rant on marketing? Absolutely. Go for it. Um, marketing is all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It's all lies. See this cup of coffee? Mm-hmm. So if a hygienist worked 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, she works 2,000 hours a year. So she could clean 1,000 people's teeth for an hour twice a year. Mm-hmm. Well, the average dental office is getting 25 new patients a month. So that would mean that every three years you would add another hygienist. Mm-hmm. So here's old man McGregor opens up his practice and he starts with a full-time hygienist. 10 years later, how many hygienists does he have? Yeah. One. Mm-hmm. 20 years later, how many hygienists does he have? One. One. 30 years later, how many does he have? One. 40 years later. And then you walk up to this son of a gun at 65 years old and say, Oh man, McGregor, what do you need? I need new patients. New patients <laughs> is like taking a cup of coffee. You have your hygienist full and mm-hmm. you just keep pouring coffee into it. And all the old coffee is running out of the side and mm-hmm. you just pour in coffee, new patients, and it just overflows old patients out the back door for 40 years. And what I always do is I steal everything from the fortune 500 and the fortune 500 doesn't believe in advertising they believe in loyalty programs mm-hmm. um um costco and sam's club they say here here's what they think they say okay the women doesn't trust me sam walton was the first one to get rid of sales he says why would it be cheaper on labor day than the day after why would i have a 10% cheaper on the 4th of July, but not the 5th of July. See, he, Sam said, if you play games with mom, that they're going to save money on a truck on the 4th of July, but the price will be higher. And she doesn't trust you. He said, we're doing everyday low pricing. We're not doing games. We're doing loyalty programs like no ask returns. You mm-hmm. return something, I take it back. Um, what, what Costco and Sam's Clubs did is they say this, mom doesn't trust me. But if I make her give me a hundred dollars. You give her a free clean exam and x-ray, then tell her she needs something. Now she thinks, oh, I'm getting screwed. But right. if the free clean exam and x-ray isn't free, but she pays you a hundred dollars for a membership to Costco, she says, well, Kirk, I gave you a hundred dollars. I'm a member. So now I trust that since I gave you a Benjamin, you'll give me a better deal. Right. Everybody dealing with women goes with loyalty programs to breed trust men 
do all this snake oil salesman advertising and they're still looking for new patients 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later when their dental office coffee cup capacity was filled up after a couple of years and you just kept pouring people in there and you don't have a bigger coffee cup or two coffee cups or three coffee cups. I don't see you at 65 with five cups of full coffee. I see you with that one coffee cup just still pouring people in there. Mom doesn't respond to marketing and advertising. Mom responds to loyalty programs. Amazon Prime members who pay 100 bucks a year spend $1,500 a year with Amazon. The non-Prime customers spend 500 I mean, Jeff Bezos talks about this. Like, Make mom feel like a member. Make her feel loyal. Make her feel special. She'll be your customer for life. Sam Walton said, all that money we'd spend on advertising, we'd rather get rid of that cost and have lower everyday prices. And if mom comes back and says, hey, old man, Walton, I bought this pair of shoes from you and the heel fell off. Sam's like, this town only has 5,000. <laughs> I'm not pissing off Mrs. Cranston over yeah. a shoe with a heel. I'm taking it back and I'm not going to argue. No questions asked. I want Mrs. Cranston for life. Mm -hmm. I don't want to run. And then he pushed all those value added up the supply chain. So the next time the shoe man came in and said, here's 10 more pairs of shoes. He's like, yeah, well, I'm trading this one back up to you. And yeah. there, and then the people would say, well, that's not my fault. And he says, look, I'm pushing all the, he actually pushed the whole warranty movement. Cause he pushed all the defects back to the factory. Finally, the factory realized, Hey, if you make shit, Walmart's going to return it and we're going to eat it. Right. It used to be we could unload this stuff on poor Mrs. Cranston. And Miss yeah. Cranston is going to... So, so every... So, <coughs> I don't want you spending 3% on advertising. I want you spending 5% on loyalty programs. Like right. you don't want to get nitrous oxide, but you want to do a Facebook ad. Uh, you don't want to... Um, get a, a wand for a pain-free shot, but you'll buy a direct mail piece. You won't buy anything that makes mom loyal, but you'll always buy an ad in the yellow pages, direct mail, Facebook ads. You're always spending money on advertising. I want all that to go to loyalty programs. Keep customers for life. And if you're going to keep pouring coffee in that coffee cup, well, a year or two later, I better see two coffee cups filled <laughs> or whatever you're doing is wrong. And with yeah. that, dude, I got to go. I got to go back to work. Buddy, you're the best. So if you're not on Dental Town, get on Dental Town now. Howard, where can people find your book? Where can I find your book? People, uh, they have to read your book. Where is it at? It's on Amazon. Okay. What's it it's called? It's on Amazon. It's called uh, Uncomplicate Business. You only manage people, time, and money. And um, just download the Dental Town app. Uh, yeah. Just download it, and now you got a you're a summation of your friends. And now you're gonna have a quarter million homies in your pocket that want to talk root canals, fillings, and crowns with you at three in the morning. Amen, brother. You're the best. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I'm crazy grateful. Thank you, Howard. So, uh, like I said, keep watching, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Best Practices Show. Mm -hmm.